Welcome to Ear Biscuits, the podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Rhett. And I'm Rhett. <laughs> That's right. You just got me this week. Uh, you have one of the lifelong friends because the other lifelong friend is living it up. He's living it up on the slopes, hopefully staying intact. Um, I haven't gotten any texts or any calls yet from him or anybody in his family informing me that he has broken his other collarbone. So fingers crossed, I'm recording this on a Thursday of the uh, week that he is gone, and he will be having his last day on the slopes tomorrow. So, so far, so good. But yeah, we were like, let's do, I don't think we've ever done this before. Jenna, do you remember us ever doing this? I do not. I don't remember this ever happening. Um, there's been a couple of times in the history of Good Mythical Morning in which one of us has been gone, mm-hmm. where somebody has subbed in. Um, but we were thinking like, ah, oh, what are we gonna do? And uh, I don't know what I don't know exactly what Link's got planned uh, for when I'm gonna be out of town. The it, it, I don't know how he's gonna handle it. But I was like, you know what? I'll do a solo one. And Jen is here on my, on the mic, so it, you know I'm comfortable doing things by myself. But I'm so used to having someone here. Link is his name, and he sits right here. <laughs> and when you have somebody that you're doing a podcast with. There are these moments that when they're talking, you can kind of be like, okay, I'm not talking right now. I can think about what I'm going to say. I can take a sip of whatever I'm drinking. Oh, yeah. Where are you supposed to look silence. now? Where are you supposed to look now? I don't I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of just looking at my camera here. <laughs> but to make it easier, um, instead of just doing, listen, what Emma Chamberlain does is kind of remarkable when you think about it because she just sits there and talks and remains very interesting. Uh, and I, I don't listen to her podcast on a regular basis, so I'm not sure if she answers questions, but the few episodes that I've listened to, it seems like she's just kind of just talking the whole time. I'm, I'm going to take the easy way out, and I'm going to make this a conversation with you because we told you that I was going to be doing this episode, and we asked you to ask me some questions. But I do want to give you a little update This is the kind of thing that I would share with Link if he was here. Uh, And that is, I had a little bit of a full circle moment this week. You might know if you've been around for a a while that we are a little bit infamous for a stunt that we pulled after college in which, as I have maintained for many years, I did not actually participate directly in this meaning I did not take a dookie in the Tupperware that was placed into the chip bag and then taken to a party and put under a couch and subsequently ruined a party. It was very immature. We had to apologize directly uh, to the women whose house this was, and we saw it as a good-natured prank, but it was not good-natured. It was foul, and uh, I don't know why we continue to talk about it. But the reason I'm talking about it today is because this week I did something that in any other context would be considered a prank, and that is I put my shit in a box and mailed it. (laughs) Uh, I'm 45, and that is when you're supposed to start putting your shit in a box and mailing it to a lab. Uh. So I do plan on getting, I'll explain why I did this. Uh, I do plan on getting a colonoscopy. And maybe Link and I will go get colonoscopies together. I mean, we got vasectomies together. So that is something that is, uh, there's a discussion that is ongoing about that. But because Link turns 45 a little bit after me, I wanted to get the head start on him. And, you know, you can, there's a service where you can shit in a box. Uh, It's more than just shitting in a box, (laughs) just so you understand. It, it, there, there's multiple layers involved. Like any box? Uh, you know, you, you, it's, a, it's a specific box. There is a specific receptacle. There is, I mean, there is kind of a process. I'm not going to go into the things that you have to do. But it seems, the, the part that was the most um, potentially humiliating to me, well, first of all, I had to tell Jesse, because 
I, I there's a thing that you put over the toilet to catch your shit, right? Uh, so you don't have to like just shit in your hand and put it in a box. They don't make you do that. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> they really thought about this. Maybe the first person that shipped their shit shit in their hand. <laughs> but since then, they have perfected this, and it's just a little plastic thing that you put on the toilet, and you just feel like you're just taking a regular shit. But I did tell my wife, I was like, don't go in the bathroom for a while because I'm working one up, and uh, I've already placed the contraption in the toilet, and I just don't want you to even see this contraption. I, don't, I only want you to see the box when it's fully sealed because I want to you know, maintain the romance. And we have a strong relationship, long relationship, and we are not one of those couples that don't fart around each other. And, you know, if somebody's defecating, maybe the door's cracked open. I don't know. We don't like, you know, we're not sitting in each other's laps taking shits or anything like that. Nothing against you if you do that kind of thing. Um, But that's not how we do it. But we're not embarrassed about those things. Bodily functions is a natural part of being a person. Uh, But I didn't want her to, to, to see this. So... Uh, yeah, there is a process, but you 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 seal it up, and then you put. There's a bag inside the box that a sealed container goes into. You pour some kind of like preservative onto it, and then you just peel off the label, and it goes to the lab. But you do have to take it into the UPS store, <laughs> right? And the box has like branding on it. For this company, and it says "human specimen" or something like that on it, and I and you know that the person working at the UPS store has collected enough of these ship boxes to know when a ship box is coming in, and I could tell by the way the woman looked at me. And she's like, "Uh huh, yep, you're of age. I know that there's shit in this box. Your shit, and to hand somebody your shit in a box." And it's not a prank. It's just like, yep, I know where this is going. In fact, she said, would you like a receipt? I almost said no. (laughs) Out of shame. But I said yes, because I figured maybe I needed some proof that I sent my shit off. And so we'll we'll see what happens. Um, I I read a little bit about the service, and apparently there's a relatively high false positive uh, that comes from this. So you could be told that you might have colon cancer, and you don't like 13% of the time. So there's like a one in 10 chance that I get a false positive. And then there is a chance that it detects something and uh, I need to get a colonoscopy earlier than I thought. But anyway, just a little personal update from me. <laughs> I I, we, I have a, a couple of uh, things we're gonna do. I've, I've got your voicemail questions that some of you asked. And I've got some Twitter questions that some of you asked and I'll just be bouncing back and forth between the two. Let's start with a voicemail. Hi, Rhett. This is Gage. Um, I'm from Michigan. Been a longtime fan. My question for you is, did you ever get made fun of in school for being so tall? Thank you, man. Have a good day. Thank you, Gage. You have a good day, too. Um, Have I ever been bullied for being tall? You know, I actually, and I probably have told this story before, I... I was bullied a little bit in school, and it was mostly because of the fact that because I played basketball and I was on the varsity team, team, even as a freshman, like I got pulled up for the playoffs as a freshman because I was tall, and my brother was on the basketball team. I wasn't that good yet. But because I was this young guy on the varsity and then the next year uh, as a sophomore on the varsity team, I was a little bit of a target, right? And when the bullying would start, it would be about how skinny skinny I was or how tall I was. So that that and, it, and that was part of it. There was one guy, I won't say his name, but he the, it was the it was the most like intense bullying um, that I that I've experienced of like being cornered in a locker room and like kind of being like punched around, like not in the face or anything, but like punched in the shoulder and stuff. At the time. It was just like, oh, this is what this guy does to everybody. And I'm going <laughs> to kind of laugh it off and just kind of get out of it. But and I didn't even, I, this is the weird thing about how different it was in the 90s. I never thought about that as bullying until 
I had kids in school and everyone talks about bullying and a lot more like um, uh, aware <laughs> and informed way. But yeah, I guess I was bullied and it would turn into mostly how skinny I was, which I think was a function of how tall I was. So maybe not directly because of how tall I was, but I was only on the basketball team because of how tall I was initially. So I could link my bullying to my tallness in that way. Thanks for the question, Gage. This one is from, this is from Twitter. This is uh, Novocaine96 who retweeted a tweet that I tweeted in 2019. And you know what? I figured this is as good a time as any to finally give you some direction here because I talked for many, many years about telling y'all my back routine, my like back stretching core exercise routine. I talk about how I do it every single day without fail, which is true. I like never miss it. Definitely haven't missed a day in 2023 and probably missed like one day in 2022 because of some weird circumstance. But uh, Novocaine said, Rhett is soon going to happen asking for me or asking for a me because I said in 19, uh, we'll share soon. Well, I'm a little late and I'm actually not going to share my routine because I'm going to just, I'm going to point you to a resource, okay? And that's, and the reason I'm not going to share my routine is because my routine is ever evolving. It's constantly incorporating new things based on need and based on, I, I'm being served up all these uh, Instagram videos and TikTok videos about mobility. Again, it's something about my age. Mobility, stretching, knee stuff, back stuff. And it's like, I'm eating that stuff up like you would not believe. Like they totally know their target audience. I want all of it. Anything to do with knees, anything to do with back. I'm going to sit there for hours watching it, making my back and knee problems worse, by the way, just sitting there in bad posture watching this stuff. Uh, but I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you or point you to a video that I think covers the core of what I do and what has remained the core of what I do every single morning. Now, if you have any sort of lower back issues, any sort of mobility issues, it, basically every single day that I get up, without fail, when I get out of the bed, my back is tight and it hurts a little bit to move. Now, there were years, probably 10 years ago, in which it was awful and it, it like I would wake up in like a six or seven out of 10 in pain in the morning and just kind of thought it was normal. Now it's more like two or three on the scale. Uh, but what I'm gonna point you to, if you just go to YouTube and you search six of the best lower back exercises, your new back mobility routine. This is from a channel called Prehab. I'm not endorsing this channel. I mean, I am because I'm pointing you to a video, but in a very quick sort of search, this guy seemed legitimate and he was doing uh, the things that I do, like the core of what I do, and he seemed like he was informed. The most important piece of the routine for me and the thing that I'll do, like if I'm in a weird scenario where, I don't know, I wake up in like a, uh, on a boat, which actually has never happened, but let's just assume that if I were to wake up on a boat and I didn't have like the space that I typically have, what's the one thing that I would do? is the cat and cow. You know, when you get on your hands and knees and you arch your back, some people call it the camel, I don't know. Cat and cow, you know what I'm talking about, Jenna. Yes, yeah, I, I only know it as cat and cow. So this is basically getting on all fours, your knees and your hands, and then arching your back each way slowly. And like, boy, that is just, and you can really kind of just get it work. You can move your butt around and kind of move in different positions. And like, that is such a, a non-negotiable for me. And the one exercise, because this is all about mobility in this video, but the one exercise that I do that I would say is also indispensable, people call it different things, but it's kind of the like, you look like a dog pointing, you know, you're on all fours and you lift up your right arm and your left leg and you switch and lift up your left arm and your right leg and you keep your core really like tight because you're not actually trying to use your lower back muscles to do it, to, to, to engage. You're engaging your entire core. Some people just call it like an arm and leg raise, whatever. 
I think you know what I'm talking about. I just call it the pointer thing because it's like a dog. I do that every single day too because it just kind of like for, for it, it gets the blood flowing to the right places. So I don't know how satisfying that was because I did say that I was gonna make a video and I decided not to make a video. I decided to point you to other videos and then point you to an exercise that I cannot remember the name of. So maybe that wasn't satisfying. <laughs> Balancing table pose. Balancing table pose? That's what they call it? That's what they call it. I'll take it. Let's move on to uh, another voicemail. Hi, Rhett. It is I, Brett. My huh. question for you is if you were offered immortality by an omnipotent being today, would you take it? Why or why not? And if so, what would you do with your immortal life? And let's assume that is the regenerative kind, so any pre-existing physical ailments, or if you lost a finger, it would all be healed up in short time. Thanks. My partner and I are big fans. Bye-bye. Brett. Rhett and Brett. I always use your name, Brett, as a way of explaining what my name is. My go-to is Brett without the B if I'm in a, lo a loud environment. What's your name? Rhett. Rick, like Brett without the B. <laughs> it tends to work. I've almost considered just changing my name to Brett because people probably don't. Maybe people think you said Brad. Brett. Brett. Brad? Brett! Like Rhett with a B. Although you're doing, that's what you're doing, isn't it? <laughs> hmm. Immortality. First of all, I may be immortal. I don't know. Uh, meaning, this version of my consciousness may go on and exist after it has manifested in this body. I don't know, right? Now, there's a lot of people out there who believe it definitely will and that my particular consciousness will be going to hell. Um, I'm almost certain that's not true. Um, I'm almost, one of the things, I think I've said this before, I, I think I've said that before, I say that a lot, I think I've said that before, it's something I said before and I'm sorry I say that so much but we talk a lot on the internet. But I think that any conception that any particular person on earth or any system of thought, including religions, uh, any conception that they have of the afterlife, any specific conception is almost certainly not true. Like one of the ways that you can figure out what doesn't happen after you die is if some existing religion on earth says that that's what happens. That's my, that's my view of it, right? That's how you rule things out. When somebody says, this is what happens when you die. Well, that's almost assuredly what doesn't happen when you die, just mathematically speaking. But I believe you, I don't know what happens when I die. So if I was betting on it, I would bet that this particular arrangement of my consciousness goes away, right? Sure, my atoms and maybe some form of spirit that I don't understand uh, goes on and, and has some sort of existence. But because I think that most likely like this version of me and this consciousness is finite, the idea of immortality is very attractive. So attractive in fact that I think it's probably the reason that many of us believe in religion. Um, and why religion is so attractive and it's so attractive to me. But because it, it, it's it's such an attractive concept, and I and I re I actually I really enjoy life. I, I enjoy new experiences and learning new things. That I think I have found a way to have my cake and eat it too, Brett. I think I would say yes to immortality. And now the first thing you think when you hear that is, surely you're gonna get tired of existing. And there's gonna be a time in which you just want to pull the plug and if you are truly immortal, you can't do that, right? But what I think you can do is I think you can induce coma. Okay? So I know you said that this was the regenerative kind of immortality, and I don't know if that means you're coma resistant, 
but you're still in a regular body. It's just immortal, right? So I think you could do the whole Disney thing, like the Walt Disney thing, which I don't actually think that he did that, but just, <laughs> did he do that? Did he freeze his head? Did he do that? Or is that just a rumor? Uh, I, uh, I think that's just a rumor. Okay, well, people do that. I need to look it up. You can cryo freeze yourself, right? And so I think what I would do is I would have, um, first thing I would do is I would just do like induced comas for like long naps. Just call them long naps and I would wake back up and I would like reinvent myself. And then when I got tired of that existence, I would induce another coma. Um, now, first of all, yes, to answer the obvious question, I would fully fulfill my duties and finish my, my life with, with Jesse and my kids and then... At some point, you know, my kids are going to have kids. Maybe they're going to have, like, at some point, like, yeah, okay, I'm a great-grandfather. One of these days, I'll be like, great-great-great-granddaddy Rhett is about to take a long nap. And when he wakes up, he's not going to have anything to do with y'all. <laughs> because he, You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, because at this point, we're just so distantly related, you know. I'm traveling all the time. I'm spending a lot of time on the other side of the world, whatever. I will have maintained my distance from my descendants, right? Because at some point I have to detach. Then I would induce the coma for a certain amount of time. I'd have to have a really good relationship with a doctor who would somehow pass on their knowledge of my situation because, I mean, worst case scenario, I guess it's not even that worst case scenario. It's just I just remain in a coma forever, and then it's just like I died, right? So I think that's my answer. I would take immortality with intermittent comas or freezing. Uh, Fluttershy. How is your James and the Shane project going? Updates on the vinyl or any future songs or possibilities? This is the question that I chose from, there, there was a sort of a vein of questions about James and the Shane, so I thought I would give my full James and the Shane update. Now, while Link isn't here and he doesn't have to just sit there and listen to me talk about my solo project, I'll just do it now while I'm soloing this podcast. Um, the update on James and the Shame, uh, you know, people ask, are you going to tour? Are you going to play? Like, probably not, you know. <clears throat> I, I, uh, I'm I, very, very focused. Like, my, pri my, my priorities in terms of my creative focus right now have always been and are especially right now what we're doing at Mythical, right? So, uh, what what I'm doing right now, Ear Biscuits, Good Mythical Morning, those are things that are gonna keep happening for an indefinite amount of time. And I have never been more excited about what we're doing creatively on the Rhett and Link channel. And uh, we have so many ideas that we wanna get out there. And so that's where my sort of creative passion is right now. However, I can't stop writing music. You know, I've probably written another 10 songs since the album came out, right? And I have, you know, I slowly dip into that and, and um, continue to, to record demos. I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. The good news is, is that a lot of the groundwork that I laid to kind of get everything set up, you know, all the accounts at all the places and the website and et cetera, that's all in place. And that took a lot of my time in the initial sort of run. Now, if I had a song and it was produced, I could just distribute it and it would show up and it would go to all the right places. So the the lift involved in getting new music out there is a lot lower. So I have plans to release more stuff. I just don't know when that's gonna happen. There's no timeline on that at all. I'm just kind of keeping it active, right? Specifically with the uh, Human Overboard stuff, with the sort of James and the Shame uh, first album, the update is when you're listening to this, uh, you will likely either be getting your vinyl any day now because I have actually, I haven't received them when I'm recording this, but they came a little bit earlier than we expected, which we were hoping. And so how that translates into when they ship out, I'm not exactly sure, but they're printed, they're ready to go, they're being packed up and shipped soon. So you might have them by the time you listen to this. Uh, and also... I probably will have already announced that I got a little, uh, a secondary little merch run that I did that I'm doing for the spring. When, when I did uh, the merch associated with Human Overboard, you know, in addition to the selling the physical album, 
we, just to be honest with you, like we did some very simple designs and like threw some things together. I was happy with it, but it wasn't like super high design, high concept and like super creative stuff. It was like, you know, tasteful, getting a logo onto a shirt kind of thing. But I've always wanted to do something that was more design conscious and more thoughtful. And so if it's not out now, it'll be out very, very soon at jamesintheshame.com is the Leviathan collection, right? So a lot of people ask about uh, the, the album cover, right? And there's these like octopus tentacles coming up and grabbing me. And then there's a boat in the back. And both of those things are sort of biblical imagery, right? The, that's Noah's Ark in the back, which kind of represents the ship of belief as I've used in that analogy. And then that creature is not an octopus, not a giant squid, it's the Leviathan, which is, you know, this is from mythology as well, not just the Bible, but basically, you know, some symbolic of chaos. And because uh, again, that's sort of the perception that I have always had about people who leave, who left the faith. And I know that's the perception that a lot of people have about me from leaving the faith is that I'm jumping into chaos, right? And I'm being wrapped up by the world. So I love that imagery <laughs> in a dark kind of sense. And, uh, we put together a few designs that, if you're watching the video right now, I'm showing you those. We've got this design, which is the Leviathan kind of taking over my head. We've got um, this design, which is the Leviathan taking over a guitar. And then we have the uh, a new James and the Shame sort of text logo that is the Leviathan uh, tentacles making the text. Um, and that's gonna be released as a t-shirt a couple of t-shirts, a hoodie, a sticker pack, and a bandana. It's country music, so you gotta have a bandana. Anyway, I'm like very, very happy uh, with this with this collection. I think it kind of represents what I wanted to do with merch and what I plan to do with any kind of merch that I do that's kind of got more of like a high design, high concept approach to it. So anyway, that's the update on James and the Shame. I don't, ha I have no, uh, I, it's so, it was so fun to play live at Mythicon, but there's just the, the amount of uh, coordination that would have to take place in order to play live, like especially with a band, is just not something that's in the cards right now. And so I just don't, I can't prioritize it. And uh, I'm just more interested in getting the music out there uh, and people being able to experience it in that way. And also just quickly, last thing I'll say, little to none of the music that I'm writing right now is a deconstruction themed, just so you know. I kind of felt like that was like, that was the first album and just, I don't know. There's just, it's of all kinds of subject matter at this point um, and, and uh, style wise, kind of the same, but changing a little bit. But anyway, I, I'm having a good time doing it. Hopefully you'll hear it at some point. Quick uh, announcement, speaking of vinyls, you can get uh, this right here, the My Hair Goes vinyl. It, this is the latest quarterly collectible item on the Mythical Society. So um, it, for years, for years, people have been asking us to rewrite the song Now That My Hair Goes Down and Link's Hair Goes Up. And so we did it. We completely re-recorded the song. Uh, Mark Byers, our producer, completely redid. I mean, it's basically a, an updated version of the song itself. Uh, of the the original song, so it kind of sounds true to the original, but much better. You can see we've basically this is an homage to the artwork that was in the song, uh, and there it is. And then the record itself is this nice blue. I like that. I like that. Those colored vinyls. Uh, you can get this. Oh, and also, it, not only does it have the original version of My Hair Goes, it has a 2023 updated version with the reverse, and on side B. It's got our song Relevant, which, did we ever play that anywhere? I, I, you we wrote it for something and we played it, oh, we played it at. You played it on the tour, on the um, Rent and Link tour, the song, yep. Yeah. We did? Uh, was that the relevant one? Like Ooh, Vic, it was VidCon London. Yes. Mm -hmm. VidCon London, mm -hmm. we like had a special performance of that song. And I guess maybe we performed it somewhere else. Anyway, it's a completely original Rhett and Link song that we wrote a while back uh, that has never been distributed. Any, it, has, it was never put on Spotify or anything. 
I don't think. So anyway, you can get this at mythicalsociety.com. It's third degree. Join third degree monthly uh, or third degree, uh, yeah, monthly by April 30th. Third degree monthly by April 30th if you want to get that vinyl. Ear Biscuits is brought to you by BetterHelp. Therapy is all about deepening yourself, especially on self-awareness and understanding, getting to the root of why you are the way you are. We're big fans of therapy and accessible therapy at that. And that's where BetterHelp comes in, to connect you with a licensed therapist to take you on your journey of self-discovery. We've been on journeys of self-discovery um, through therapy over the past few years. Also and on this podcast. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, it's and a, that is exhibited a, through the podcast. It's definitely a form of self-discovery. Uh, but it has become an indispensable part of our growth. Yeah, so we want you to try out therapy, and BetterHelp is a great way to do that. Completely online and affordable. Just fill out a questionnaire to get matched to a licensed therapist and change at any time with no extra cost to you. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash ear today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash ear. Here's another Twitter question from Brittany. Okay, hypothetical question. In a mass zombie slash shutdown situation, do you stay put for a period of time or head inland with hope of making it past the mountains for safety? Brittany, I cannot tell you how many times I've thought about this. Um, not specifically about a zombie situation. I don't actually think that that's plausible. But there are many uh, shit hitting the fan types of situations that could happen. I mean, we kind of live in a constant shit hitting the fan situation right now, and so it's like there's nothing that could surprise me at this point. Um, many different things could go wrong, right? And Los Angeles is like one of the worst places you could be, right? Just like one of the worst places you could be. And I think about this on a pretty regular basis because you know how I think about the apocalypse into the world stuff. And I like to think that I'm prepared. I'm not really, I have some stuff, I've got some food, you know, <laughs> but not enough. I mean, we already know that Link's gonna be at my house with this whole family, they're gonna be eating my stuff. I mean, I gave him, when I got ready with my stuff a while back, I gave him some stuff, but you know, he's gonna run out, he's gonna show up at my place, all of a sudden, all the McLaughlins and Neils are all together. And um, and then whoever else, you know? And so, LA, if you go south, you basically, I mean, you can, you get to, eventually get to San Diego, eventually get to Mexico. Um, that's that's actually probably the only direction that you could you could head if you were trying to get out of town, right? Because if you go east, you're going to eventually hit desert, right? If you go north, you're going to very quickly come to just it's so desolate, it's so desolate. Like we we just drove up there the other day uh, for a video, and as soon as you leave Los Angeles, you're in this desolate mountain range, and then you come down to the hill on your way to Bakersfield, and it's just, I mean, there's nothing out there, right? Being on the East Coast would be such a better situation. And, you know, of course, we have a family We have family on the East Coast. If we could get to the, if I knew something was about to hit the fan, like if I had a real indication that things were about to go sideways, I would get to the East Coast as fast as I could because there's like more regular water sources, you know, less people, et cetera. But I think, honestly, like, if there was a giant earthquake that shut things down, I think I'd just be holding steady for as long as I could. I definitely don't think I'd start. There's just no good place to go around here, right? And you're gonna be going there with millions of people who are also trying to get on the road. So everything's gonna be completely uh, uh, backed up. So... I think I would just take my chances at home. But I do think about it. And I do have some, I do know some of some spots in the mountains that I have like scoped out that like there's like little streams and stuff. But I just know I'm gonna have to like fight people over it. I think about this when I'm hiking. I'm crazy. 
I'm hiking and I like see a little creek and there's not there's not a lot of streams and stuff like actively in the mountains. Right now they're all filled with water because it's been raining, but they dry up quite a bit. But I'm like, hmm, yeah, I could I could set up a little shelter there and then people would be coming in here to try to get water and I'd have to like judge whether or not I was gonna let them in and then like we we have to have some sort of system and how long would this water last? I think about these things. What am I gonna do to filter it? How many deer are there really in this woods that we could eat? When are we gonna start eating each other? (sighs) Thanks for the pick me up, Brittany. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, let's have another voicemail yeah i just want to know like what's red's hair routine (laughs) okay (laughs) um okay i get asked this question a lot and again i'm going to take the opportunity of link not being present because you can you imagine can you imagine what Link would do to me if I went into my hair routine? Could you imagine how hard of it? You, you people think that I give him a hard time? Have you ever actually listened to the way we interact? Have you actually ever listened to the things he says to me? Have you actually ever processed it? He wouldn't let me get away with that for a minute without making fun of me every which away. Just saying. Just saying. So I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity where he's not present to tell you my hair routine. Listen, there's, it's not exciting. There's not a lot that's going to, uh, there's not a lot to it. And all I do is literally about once a week I wash my hair. Okay? Let me just start there. I wash it and condition it and like, brush it out like once a week. And if it's a week where I'm like working out a lot or get really sweaty, I'll add a second wash in there, but I don't wash it very often. That's the first thing I do. The second thing I do, and it doesn't stink, if that's what you're asking, my hair doesn't stink, okay? Partly because the only product I put into it is this um, Curl Renew spray. I've used a couple of different brands. I'm not going to endorse anyone. There's many up there and they all kind of work the same as far as I can tell. I basically take a shower and I take a shower at night, wash my hair, go to uh, bed with my hair kind of wet. And then I wake up the next day and I spray this curl renew stuff in there. And then that's like the only thing that I put into my hair besides spraying water on it to get it to reactivate that stuff. And that's all I do. And, it only, and that works on my hair, and people have been like, I'm trying to grow my hair out. And I'm like, listen, if you don't have a little, it's like slightly curly hair, that probably won't work for you. You either have, like, Jenny, you've got curlier hair than me. Mm-hmm. You yes. probably have to do, you do something else, I assume. Uh, yeah. I, I, yeah, I do different stuff than you. But the, the, wa- the spritzing with water, um, that's all curly hair that works for, that you do. Right. That was a big tip. Mm-hmm. Annalyn. Annalyn hooked us up with that tip. Um, and if your hair is straight with no curling at all, I mean, it's like you can't, I don't think you can make it curly without like some sort of. Lots of product. Contraption Lo- or something. Lots you know? of product and probably um, like a curling iron. Yeah, because people are like, do the curly girl method or whatever. I'm like, listen, I don't, oh. <laughs> I don't like having my hair long. I don't like the inconvenience. That's why that listen, that's why I wash it once I didn't I'm not like I wash it once a week because you shouldn't wash your hair more than once a week. I wash it once a week because it takes too damn long to wash it and condition it and comb it all out. And so I'm just like, yeah, that once a week it gets pretty knotty. I'm in the shower for a while. It's probably not advisable. I should probably wash it more. I don't know. I'm just telling you what I do. That's what you asked. I'm not recommending it. But yeah, I'm just saying Put some of that curl renew stuff in there. I've used the cheap ones and the expensive ones. They all seem to work about the same. Uh, and then spray a little bit of water on your hair. Like if I'm coming in and we're going to shoot GMM and I've got that stuff in my hair, I'll just spray a little water. And then it's like, okay, it's kind of curly. Sometimes it looks better than others. Sometimes it does get a little greasy looking. Like right now, I'm on day four. Okay? That's what it looks like day four. We need to get you some dry shampoo. 
Well, I've done the dry shampoo. You don't like it? I did it for a while, but it kind of like, I don't know. I feel like it gives me dandruff. It oh. like dries my scalp out. Mm-hmm. I make my own. I don't use the sprays. You make your own dry shampoo? Yeah. Because the also sprays, usually for dark hair, just, it doesn't work. It doesn't. It, it is always like a grayish tint that mm, it leaves. I can see that. Here's a Twitter question for T1D Chuck. Why are you still doing what you do? This is not a jab. I love your work, but curious about what motivates you to keep going and moving forward. Um, this is representative of a question that seemed to um, come from a number of people like, what keeps you motivated? What gets you up in the morning? Why do you keep going? You've been doing this for a long time. Um, I think, it, first of all, let me just start by saying, I think it's at least partly pathological. <laughs> um, I don't think I have a diagnosable uh, disorder, but I do have a personality that is um, just, I don't know, I. It, Every day I wake up, I'm kind of overwhelmed with a number of things that I want to do. And I'm sort of preoccupied with a number of things that I have yet to do that I want to do professionally. The ideas that I want to bring into the world and the things that I want to try. And so far, fingers crossed, those ideas have never stopped coming, right? The, the ideas continue to kind of overwhelm me. I'm not, and I'm probably going to go through, I'm sure I'll go through some sort of creative drought. People ask about that a lot. And the reason I don't answer that question, I'm like, well, it hasn't happened yet, thankfully. Usually it's creative overload. It's too many things at once, too many things that I'm really passionate about and too many things that I want to try. And then I'll just start doing them. And I think I kind of live my life in the deep end, meaning I'm treading water. I'm constantly treading water. And when I wake up, it, and, and this is gonna sound, this might sound like kind of torturous and I'll, I'll get to the good part of this in a second, but like when I wake up, it feels like I'm waking up in the deep end and I gotta, it, it, I can't go back to sleep when I wake up because 17 things enter my mind that I could be working on, that I need to be moving forward. And I've been this way for a really long time. And so I say pathological because I don't think that that's uh, necessarily normal and I don't think that's healthy. Um, I've actually been doing a better job of recording my dreams lately to kind of, I've been doing this because some, so many of you, uh, suggested that I read more about, uh, Carl Jung. Uh, I think I'm just going to say Carl Jung because every time I try to say the way you actually pronounce his name, my wife laughs at me because it's just one of those things that I can't quite get right. Like <laughs> I listen to a book and people say Jung. Then people say young, and then people say young. And I can already pronounce the word young, so I'm going to just say that. Carl Young. He was really into dreams. And I was just like, out of curiosity, I, you know, I'm just going to start recording more, more of my dreams. I'd like to get better at that. I have some crazy dreams. But what I've noticed is that so many of my dreams are me facing a really like insurmountable problem. Like I'll be in a weird situation and I'll be like, oh, I'm trying to get out of this canyon and then I get to the edge and there's a weird incline and I know that I'm not gonna, it's like, how am I gonna grip that? And then it kind of in the middle of addressing that challenge, I'll wake up. Last night I had a dream that uh, I had been drafted to the NBA to play for the Lakers, which is not something I'm after at this point. Uh, I don't wanna play for the Lakers, first of all. <laughs> Let's just be honest, I'm a Clippers fan. <laughs> Second of all, I'm not NBA material, actually never was. Um, but in this dream, I was drafted into the NBA and I was still living at home, but I also had Shepard as a son, which was weird. And I was in my childhood bedroom and I was packing up to go to LA for my first game. And I couldn't find my basketball shoes. And I was like, I think I, they're, they're the, the Nikes. I was like, yeah, they wear the, they wear Nikes. Um, <clears throat> this is 
for some reason in my dream, it was still like the 80s where all everybody wore the same shoe versus just people wore whatever they want to. <laughs> and it was like, they're the purple and gold Nikes. And I don't have them and I'm not going to fit in when I show up. <laughs> I've got these green Reebok. I'm going to get kicked off the team. <laughs> That's just an example. Like every dream that I have that I've been recording in 2023, the ones that I've remembered have been like, I'm in this situation where I, there's a piece that I don't have, right? And I'm sure that's a relatively, these are common dreams, but I just think there's a lot of that, again, that waking up in the deep end. And I think that's a huge part of what keeps me going because I just like look at all the, this stuff that we've committed to and all the stuff that I personally want to do and that we together want to do, and that we want to do as a company. And I just kind of like, it's constantly there in front of me. And I just have it, it, that's yet to be very, not be motivating for me. Like it's just always very motivating. And yeah, it gets stressful at times, but I every single thing that we're doing for the most part is so engaging. And when I say the most part, I mean like all the stuff that you see, very engaging. There's business stuff that I have to do that I, that I don't enjoy. Um, but what we're doing with Good Mythical Morning right now, I'm enjoying it more than I ever have. Like, I'm just having such a good time shooting the show. And that hasn't always been the case, you know? Sometimes it's felt like work. Right now, it doesn't feel like work. I love doing this show, especially when Link's not here. No, I'm just kidding. I <laughs> love uh, doing the show with Link. I actually think that um, because we don't end up talking about a lot of things we save certain conversations for the show. You're hearing us talk about things for the first time sometimes. Um, this show has been a lot about maintaining uh, our friendship in a lot of ways. I mean, how many friends do you have that you sit down and talk to for an hour and a half every single week, right? Like, if you, that's a good friend. And of course, we talk a lot more than that, but like this show is basically, hey, our friendship on display. I love doing this show. Um, and of course, I've said it a million times, what we're doing creatively on the Rent Link channel, I'm super engaged with. So all this stuff is stuff that I really, really want to do, but I'm still figuring out what it is about me that commits to these things. I just throw myself in the deep end. I'm like, well, you gotta tread water, you gotta swim to the shallow end, you gotta do something. And that's the engine that has kept running this, you know, the, the way I do things creatively for a really long time. I'm in therapy. So I'm figuring out exactly what that's, I know that there's like you know, performance, based family things and it's my personality and all these things, trying to prove something, trying to figure out what it is that I'm trying to prove. But for me, uh, it's just the combination of my personality and then my job. Because if I was in a job that I didn't enjoy, I think I would actually get pretty unmotivated because I can get a little scattered but because I can take all these different interests and all these things that I'd like to see come into the world and there's a way for us at Mythical to make those things happen together as a team, um, it keeps me going. I hope that answered your question. Chris on Twitter, introspect CP. How do you think you would have dealt with your deconstruction if Jesse wanted her and your kids to remain active in the faith? And how do you think it would affect your relationship with religion with them and with them had they remained to this day? This is a really good question. Um, I'll say, I, I could imagine it would have been very, very difficult, right? Um, I know families where this has happened, um, where one person decides that they're gonna peace out from Christianity or whatever the family's religion is, and they've got kids. And I've seen this end in divorce. Uh, I think that's pretty common because it's so foundational uh, to the way that you approach things, the way you talk about things, and, the, and sort of the way that you talk to your kids. Um. But I actually think that, um, you know, I never, there was never a moment where I tried to like talk Jesse into something or try to convince her of anything. I was just sharing things that were happening with me, doubts that I was having, how my, sh my faith was being reshaped and my worldview was sort of being unwound. And, you know, she responded with tears and panic 
It was not good. It was not good. Every, and I would hold back the things that I was thinking because her reactions would be pretty extreme. Um, and sort of, I would just kind of slowly uh, meter these things out over time. But slowly, she started having her own, for very different reasons than me, honestly, her own deconstruction that I'm sure was at least initiated or influenced by mine. But I think I think her seeing me begin to deconstruct but remain who I was and remain committed to her and us gave her this sense of safety and freedom to begin her own deconstruction. And so let's just say that that had not happened. Would have been really, really tough as it relates to the kids. You know, interestingly, uh, my kids, man, they were asking really, really difficult questions before we ever shared anything. Before we, while we were still going to church, you know, I mean, Shepard was a little bit too young, but Locke, from, yeah, I remember the first time he came back from church when he was like four, and they had been talking about the Israelites and the conquest of the, the promised land and, he had a lot of questions <laughs> about the nature of God and the nature of genocide <laughs> um, that we didn't have great answers for at the time, right? Especially that a four-year-old could understand. He was asking some really difficult questions that I never asked as a kid, you know? So I'm not sure how long he would have stuck around to be honest with you. So I don't think uh, his, you know, his perspective on faith or Shepard's perspective on faith has actually been... Uh, particularly influenced by mine. They're very much their own people. But let's just say that Jesse had been like, it's very important for me to remain a Christian and it's very important for me for the kids to remain in the church and the faith. First of all, I wouldn't have fought that. I would not have tried to change that because for me, the stakes are so much lower than they were as a Christian, right? That's a, That's something that's very difficult to to understand when I that's it was very difficult for me to understand when I was a Christian because when you are a Christian and the type of Christian that I was uh, the stakes are so high it is life and death it is good and evil it is heaven and hell it is eternity right and these decisions are so weighty and when you deconstruct and you kind of your deconstruction involves and in, in embracing of uncertainty and just being like, hey, I don't really know what I think about a lot of this stuff and I'm kind of uncertain and um, I, you become a lot less interested in trying to persuade people and trying to change people's minds. And so I think that my kids having faith, my wife having faith might be something that was a little annoying at times, <laughs> you know, if they were to say something. I was like, well, have you thought about this? but it wouldn't be catastrophic in the way that it would be catastrophic from their perspective as Christians, right? So let me just say that a different way. So if you are um, an atheist and your partner becomes a Christian, you may describe that as catastrophic, but it really it might just be disappointing or annoying or complicating, but it's actually not catastrophic because you don't believe that they are in danger of some sort of eternal damnation from God and separation from God and separation from you. But if you're a Christian and your partner becomes an atheist and you stay in your faith, that is catastrophic because they are you know, ensuring their own destruction, eternal destruction and damnation. That's the stakes are so high. Um, but that's not really a reciprocal thing. So I, I think it would just be like, yep, this is who my family is and I just kind of deal with it and I try not to be an embarrassment to them and we try not to talk about it too much, whatever. I, I hope that that's what it, that's the way that things would settle. And I think that now, because I've kind of been through my sort of angry anti-Christian phase and I'm now I'm kind of more in an open place and I you know I know that people who are still in the faith or in another faith are in many ways just as justified um, in their worldview as I am I try I try to be less critical you know people want to talk about things or get my opinion about a particular thing or the validity of something or what my perspective on it is I'll tell them 
But ultimately, as I said in my deconstruction update, I feel like where I'm at is almost exclusively a combination of my particular disposition and the circumstances that I found myself in in this life. And I think that's how most people operate. And so um, I wouldn't be too uh, judgmental, I guess is what I'm saying. I would just be like, yep, this is, this is the situation. I'll tell you what I think if you ask me, but I'm not going to sit and try to make my kids become apostates with me. Let's have another voicemail. Hey, Rhett, I just, I just had a question for you. I just was wondering, out of any artist in the world of all time, who, who, who would you collab with all on a time. song? Like a low-down, dirty country song or a nice blues song or bluegrass. I, I just want to hear what, what you think, man. This is Hunter in Michigan. I just want to say I love you, and uh, you're doing a great job. All right, thanks. I love you too, Hunter. Low down, dirty country song. <laughs> you might think that the answer to this question would be somebody I greatly respect, like Merle Haggard, right? But I actually think that's not the right answer. Because I think when you do a collaboration with another musician, you don't want them to be a lot better than you. You ever heard those collaborations where like, you got two people singing and the one that's like really good really stands out next to the person who's collaborating with them. I'm not going to call out any examples, but you probably have an idea of the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So I wouldn't want to like ruin a song by collaborating with Merle Haggard because his voice, you, you like when you listen to uh, now, if you're if you're like a real like music critic and like understand music, you listen to James and the Shame, and you'll be like, okay, well, this would be better if you had a great voice. Like if you really know, you know. But most people are probably be like, oh, yeah, I mean, she sounds pretty good, you know. But if you were to listen to my voice right next to Merle Haggard's voice, you would be like, oh, this is a this is a different thing. This man is operating on a different plane. There's a just a natural thing that's happening, an effortless quality to it. So I would not want to collaborate with somebody like that. Um, I actually looked up a uh, a list of the most popular yet worst singers of all time, and I found that these lists varied by quite a, a bit. But there were two people that were on all of these lists. Bob Dylan and Britney Spears. Damn. Okay, so popular musicians who actually cannot sing. And listen, no Britney hate around here. Um, I'm just saying this is what the people think. And if you think about it, uh, you just think about a Britney song. You're like, okay, yeah, there's a lot of whispering happening, you know? <laughs> It's a, there's not as much singing happening as you think there is. Just go listen, right? And Bob Dylan cannot sing. We already knew that. He already knows that. But that's kind of the thing about him, right? So I think I would use this as my opportunity, and I'm using it right now. Um, Bob, Brittany, if you're listening, I'm thinking about a three-way musical collab. The three of us. Bob writes the lyrics, I write the music, Britney does the dance routines, music video, that's the musical collab of my dreams. I think it'd be great, nobody would outshine anybody else. You know, we all bring our gifts. You got any opinions about that, Jenna? Uh, I would love to see Britney choreograph so songs f with you and Bob Dylan. Yeah, right. I would love to mm -hmm. see that. Yes. Free Britney. I love Britney. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> okay. May Wilson. Do you feel like the pandemic changed your perspective on parenting? I know as a teen going through it, my family slash parent situation changed a lot, and I'm curious how it was for your fam. Um, 
as I was indicating a little earlier when we were talking about the apocalypse, is it just me or have we become a bit numb to just how tenuous this whole civilization thing is, right? Like as of today, I don't know. I don't know what it's like when you're listening to this, but as of today, um, we're on the tail of this pandemic. Um, you know, we got banks that are failing. And, you know, people who know more than I do about this are like, ah, oh, there's nothing to worry about. And that bank, these banks failed for particular reasons. And I tend to agree with, or whatever, but um, we're basically in World War III. I mean, let's just be honest, right? I mean, that we're giving a bunch of money to a country that is fighting Russia. And then there's like other countries like around that country that are like giving their jets to the country to fight Russia. And I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna talk about the, uh, you know, the right or the wrong of the, in, the, the, the war. Uh, but I think, oh, and also by the way, uh, there's aliens, right? <laughs> it's like, I mean, or there, or there's something, right? There, there's something that like people who, uh, are informed about this stuff and have information, access to information about things that we don't have access to information about. I'm not talking like conspiracy level stuff. I'm talking about senators who have been briefed on things and come out of meetings and say things like, there are things that the American people deserve to know. Uh, what are you talking about? And it's not even surprising to us anymore. We, we, we don't even call anybody, right? We, we, it's just every single day. Um, I, I I answer it in that way, May, because I was thinking about this the other day as we were talk. Jesse and I were talking about our kids. We worry about our kids. That's what we do as parents, right? You worry about uh, the, the decisions that they're going to make and who they're going to be and how involved should you be and all this. But the thing I said to Jesse was, I was like, we live in a crazy, crazy world. Like when I was their age, like, so when I was Locke's age, when I was 19, it was 97, 1997, right? I mean, I don't, I think people forget. I think people forget what it was like to be in the 90s. This is, so this is like pre 9-11. So that like late 90s, pre 9-11, it was just like, anything's possible. Anything's possible. Like, we live in this great country. We get we got everything that we need. Oh, you just you just you just go to college and then you get a job and you live the American dream. It just seemed really really simple. And then it, you know reality. And first of all, let me just say that wasn't the case for everybody. I'm talking about me, upper middle class white boy from North Carolina. Okay, I'm just talking about my situation. That wasn't the case for everybody. But that was my perspective at the time. Now I'm, I, I'm like, there's so many things going sideways that I don't even understand what my kid's life will be like when they're my age. Like, what is the, what is the world gonna be like? So I would say, yes, the pandemic and then every other thing that I've mentioned and all the things that I haven't mentioned have actually pretty substantially changed my perspective on parenting. Because at this point, the thing that Jesse and I talk about is like, we just want to have a relationship with our kids. Like if we can have a good relationship with our kids, that's we we've won at the game of life, right? Like what are they going to do? And what are they who are they going to be? And what are they going to do for a living? And what are they going to care about? It's like I mean, I just hope that they're healthy and that I have a relationship with them. Not that, not that we don't continue to have conversations about what's the best decision to make in this area of your life. And like, you know, if you, have, if you have want advice, we're gonna give it to you. But I try to hold on to that. Like, I mean, we might just be like in a, in a apocalyptic landscape going around dressed in animal skins. You know what I'm saying? That could be the reality. 
I just want a relationship. Uh, Rebecca Bryson, for the love of God, what did Los Angeles, that's my wife, get you for Christmas last year? You absolutely left us hanging for over a year. I did, didn't I? <laughs> I did, and I'm sorry about that. Um, well, I'm going to tell you right now what she got me. Jess, and I don't think I'm going to show it to you, but I'm going to tell you what she got for me. But I'm not going to show it to you right now. Maybe never. Uh, and that is because Jesse uh, was getting to know, um, well, she had a friend that she was doing some work with. She was talking about how, I just don't know what to get him for Christmas. I want to, And she actually uh, meant to get this for my birthday, but timing worked out. So it ended up becoming a, a Christmas present. She was like, he really likes pen and ink art. Because we had gone and stayed at this place um, in Big Sur for our 20th anniversary. Had a great time up there. And, you know, we had planned on going to Italy. Pandemic happened. And so we kind of splurged a little bit on a California vacation and stayed at a really nice place in Big Sur. And they had a, um, it's one of these places that they kind of know that the people staying at this place have money. And so they have like a shop on site that's got all this ridiculously expensive stuff um, that we typically do not buy, <laughs> you know? Um, but it's but we were like we're gonna look at this stuff. So we like go into this little gift shop that's got jewelry that's just that tens of thousands of dollars for these piece these handmade pieces and stuff. But then on display there's this giant drawing. I mean like twelve feet wide, pen and ink, and I and I immediately am just so drawn to it. Like, this is this crazy, intricate world that, like, the closer you get to it, the more detail comes out in this thing. But it's this giant world. And then the woman sees me looking at it. She's like, oh, you, uh, you see, you, the so-and-so has caught your eye. Um, well, let me tell you about that. And she goes on to tell me that it's these two artists in Brazil that either one or both of them are ambidextrous and draw ambidextrous, not ambidextrous, ambidextrous and draw with both hands at the same time. And this particular picture, which is called something, took them over a year to make and that this was the original. And I was like, well, how much is it? She was like, it's $150,000. And of course I'm like, hmm. <laughs> Okay, I act like that. I okay, sure. Of course, I did not did not purchase it. Uh, she said we have a print of this in uh, in one of our rooms, um, and I believe that um, I believe that the 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 guests of, of that room are. I th I, th I think that they're out of there, and. Uh, as we're walking to the room to see the print, we see John Ham and his girlfriend, who he met in Big Sur. Spoiler alert about Mad Men final season. Takes he gets he gets groovy in the in uh, Big Sur with this woman, and they became real life partners. Anyway, we went into. Uh, the room that they had been staying in, which is where this print was. And we looked at the print. She didn't get me the print, by the way, because that print, uh, all, just the print was like $18,000. Okay, so again, I don't spend that kind of money on art. And But she's telling a friend about this. And the friend is like, I have a friend who is actually really good at pen and ink, and he'll, he does commission pieces. And she met with this guy, 
Ronnie Ray, Ronnie Ray Mendez. And she basically, Jesse wrote like a couple of pages about our life story. And he used this life story to do a like four by six feet pen and ink drawing that was representative of our lives. And it was incredible. It wasn't 12 feet wide and in John Hamm's hotel room, but it was incredible and it was incredibly personal. And it ended up taking him longer than he expected because he hadn't done a piece this big before. Uh, maybe I'll show it at some point, but I feel like it's just so personal and it's so much about us. Um, but that's what she got me for Christmas. And she said it was the best, she was like, I'm gonna give you the best gift that you've ever gotten. And it was very, very much so the best gift I've ever gotten. And I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you about that until right now. Let's do a um, couple more voicemails and then I'm gonna do a rapid fire to finish up. Hey Rhett, this is Maggie from Denton, Texas. I was wondering, are there any habits or traits that you've picked up from Link over the years that you just can't seem to shake? Love you guys. That's a good question. You know, I was um, I was talking to Shepard recently, recently as in the past year, and uh, I was like, Shepard's talking a little different. I'm picking up on the fact that Shepard's talking a little different. Just a slight, sort of one of those, can't really put my finger on exactly what it is that's different about the way he's talking. Something about the inflection. And then I met his new friend. And I was like, oh, okay. He's talking a little bit more like this guy. Which that's something that's very, very common, right? Get into a friend group, there's just these little subtle things about the way they communicate. And so when I read this question, I thought to myself, well, if there has to be so many mannerisms and ways of expressing myself that are very rooted in my friendship with Link. I don't know if you saw this, Stevie Experience. sent it to us. Um, I don't know, I can't remember the account, but somebody posted a TikTok called Rhett and Link being in sync for yeah, 10 minutes or something like that. And it was, Exactly what it sounds like. It was a, uh, a montage of all these moments that we've been perfectly in sync, both physically, but what we're saying, and then sometimes just the noises that we're making. And we're pretty different guys, right? You know, we, there's a there's a contrast between the two of us that I think really works for our uh, what we do for a living in the entertainment business. You wouldn't want two of me, and you wouldn't want two of him. Um, but we work well together as a team. But I don't know what those things are. I'd have to have somebody point those things out and I think they'd be so ingrained into who I am that you'd have to go back to, I don't know, I've known him since I was in freaking first grade. So I, I would be such a different person for multiple reasons, not just because of the way my mannerisms or my expressions or whatever have been influenced and the way that his have been influenced by me. Um, there would be a lot more than that, but I'm sure that th those things would be um, a part of it. But one thing I will say that I definitely thought about in answering this question is, as you might have noticed, Link has always been a few steps ahead of me uh, in the fashion department. In the past year or two, he's begun to do a little bit of a sprint in the fashion department, which, uh, you know, when you are in a, uh, when you are in a duo, an entertainment duo of any kind, and you have to appear with each other in multiple settings, not the least of which is your show that you're together all the time on. Um, somebody moving forward at the pace that Link is moving forward in his fashion expression zone, uh, it has an influence on me because I'm the guy that if I could wear the same thing every single day, like Dennis the Menace, that's what I would wear, right? Um, it would be like a comfortable, solid um, collared shirt that fits like this, uh, sleeves rolled up, some sort of like not skinny but not loose 
jeans, probably like those Lululemon pants that are just more comfortable, you know? The ones I wear when I'm flying. And then some like dad tennis shoes, which by the way, I bought the daddest pair of tennis shoes. I can't wait to wear them on the show. <laughs> you would not believe how big the bottoms of these things are. And I think they're fashionable, I think. I'm not really good at picking up on those things. Anyway, what I'm getting at is that uh, while my style is not um, uh, informed directly by Link, because I'm not trying to do the same things that Link is doing, if you see me wearing like a new shirt or a sweater or something that seems interesting, it's because if I don't do that, it will get too imbalanced. That's the honest reason. That's the, so Link has a direct impact on my fashion. And there's things like, um, okay, when the jeans started getting really skinny, right? Like, of course, Link was gonna be the one to get the really skinny jeans earlier than me. And I'm just like, man, I'm six foot seven. I'm gonna look like a fucking idiot in these jeans. You know, I got other things I got to think about. I'm too tall for this. But eventually here I am with my skinny jeans because I can't be the guy next to the guy on the internet who's got the fashionable skinny jeans on and I've got like the dad jeans on. I'd be fine being the guy with the dad jeans on, but I just gotta keep the balance intact. And then now, of course, it's like, well, now the jeans are getting big again, and now we got to roll them up, and they've got to be bigger, and they don't look good, by the way. Like, the skinny ones and the big ones, neither of them look good. A good jean is just like a Levi's 501. I mean, if you want to be honest about it, it's just a straight jean that's just covering your leg and keeping you from getting caught in briars and stuff. I mean, that's the purpose of a jean, right? That's what I would have, is I would have a functional outfit. And the day that we stop doing this, which is probably never, by the way, uh, I will just wear basically like five shirts and five pair of pants. That's what you'll see me in. It'll be a little bit boring. So yeah, that's one of the ways that, uh, that is a trait of Link that I have picked up uh, is my fashion ability, if I have any. And one last uh voicemail before we get into some rapid fire, because I wanted to get to as many questions as possible. A little birdie told me Rhett's recording a solo episode. So I thought I'd ask a burning question I've had for a while. Rhett, what's your favorite kind of cheese? Please let me know. Thank you. What's Bye. your favorite kind of cheese? Woo! That gets me excited when you ask me these things. I've had so many good cheese. Cheeses. I've had so many good cheeses. <laughs> but I do think I have a favorite. Um, when we were in Amsterdam, Jenna, were you in Amsterdam? No. I mean, I was, just not with you all. Oh, gosh. Ooh, no, I've made a mess. You were in Australia with us. That's where... Yes. Well, when we were in Amsterdam, um, we did the thing where you do, like, the t the tour, and you, like, go see the you know, flower fields, and you see the windmills, and you see the wooden shoes that no one actually wears. And a cheese shop is a part of this stop. I don't think it's actually in... I think they say Hauda which is Gouda, you know, we get, we, we say Gouda, but it's Hauda or something mm -hmm. like that in Dutch. It's an actual city, right? It's where that cheese comes from. And at this cheese shop, that was one of the stops, they had aged Gouda cheese, aged at different levels. There was like some fresh or like a cut, like three months, one year and three years. And of course, we got the cheese. When Christy was there, she got the cheese as well. We kept this cheese for months because I was just eating a little bit of it at a time. And specifically, the three-year aged Gouda. Well, this is what happens when Gouda cheese ages. You've probably had some cheese before that had, it was like a kind of a smooth cheese, but as you bit into it, there were these little crystals, these little crunchy parts to it, right? I don't understand what's happening, 
But that happens with some cheeses, like it happens with uh, cheddar, happens with Gouda, happens with Parmesan. Some sort of chemical thing happens as it ages. So a good aged cheddar will have this as well, where it just has this incredible creamy sort of uh, intense, like creamy texture with these intense like crystal uh, bites that are in there. These pockets of crystals, and then the flavor is just, it's intensified, and it's like gotten smooth but intense somehow. So I would say it might it, it, it might sound like kind of a, um, too, a little too simple of a cheese answer to say aged Gouda, but I just don't think it gets better than a really good aged Gouda. You should try it. If you haven't had it, go get some three-year aged Gouda from somewhere. I'm sure you could get older older than that, but that was the oldest they had at this shop. That's my favorite cheese. I haven't necessarily found a brand brand here in the States that was as good as that I had in Amsterdam. Now, for some rapid fire questions uh, from Twitter. Vanessa, what are some things that sound like compliments but are actually insults? This is easy. I used to watch your videos as a kid. <laughs> Matt Dipong, have you done any sensory deprivation floats since the GMM episode several years ago? I have. In fact, after that episode, we got contacted by uh, someone who uh, ran a local float uh, place. And uh, before the pandemic, I went a few times. Haven't been since. I got to go again. Thank you for reminding me. Kaya, do you have a secret Instagram slash Twitter, et cetera, for nefarious or other purposes? Nope. I don't. Josh Bell, is there any part of being an engineer that you miss? Nope. <laughs> Hardly a professional. What you rather do? Abstain from eating beans for two months or get a shave and a buzz cut? As much as I love beans, I would go the rest of my life <laughs> if I had to. You're not gonna see this face without a beard anytime soon, unless, I mean, maybe for a lot of money for charity or something, but even then it's gonna complicate so, me shaving will complicate so many other people's lives that it probably won't be worth any amount. You know? Jenna's like, oh yeah, I can only imagine. Yep. <laughs> the continuity conversations around here. <laughs> anytime a haircut happens. Golly, like, <laughs> Link changing his damn glasses Oh man! Created an uproar. So much consternation <laughs> around here. You don't even you, you don't even know how the system works around here. You have no idea. They're like, but we have like five months worth of merch drops planned based on his old glasses and thumbnails and all. The anyway, <laughs> me shaving would be a problem. The least of which being the way I looked. Gracie Archer, Rhett, should I get a puppy? Yes, of course you should. Serenity. Fear up, how do you ever wish you could be shorter? Yes, 6'2". Madison Lesnar, how many chuggas do you say before choo-choo? Chugga, 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 choo, choo. Eight. Caitlin Kent, have you thought about getting any more tattoos? Yes, Caitlin, I have. I talked about this a little bit on Go Mythical More. I would like to get something on my left forearm. Right now, the best idea I have is a full blue whale skeleton that covers the entire inside of the forearm. I may get a better idea, but I, would, I really like that idea. Trend. Do you have any stuffed animals or perhaps physical items that bring you comfort no matter what? They could be from your childhood, a recent purchase, something that just sits on a shelf, et cetera. I don't, but I do find that I like holding smooth rocks. So sometimes my wife will find me a smooth rock and bring it home and I'll hold it. <laughs> Not any rock in particular, just smooth rocks. Ash, if you had to die by drowning in a bowl of soup, what kind of soup would you request? My favorite soup as I've established is uh, French onion soup. And I do believe that I couldn't drown in that. Just so you, I mean, I think between the bread and the cheese on top, I think I could keep my head above water. 
or head above soup. <laughs> and then I would slowly drink my way out of it. So, foiled! <laughs> Alicia, when did you realize that you had your life together? <laughs> Not yet, Alicia. I'll let you know. When I get there. We got a team of people still trying. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. We're working on it. <laughs> and that's it. This has been fun. 85 minutes or so of your time. Um, yes, we have. We, we keep a count. We have a timer. If we've never revealed that to you before, we have a timer. Just to know how long winded we're being. Uh, I knew I could do it. <laughs> I knew I could go an hour and a half by myself. Uh, I'm not done because I'm going to give you a wreck. And this is cheese related. And it is uh, a technique you should try if you're a cheese lover that I found on TikTok or Instagram. You've probably seen it too, but have you tried it? Have you tried just taking some grated cheese? I use sharp cheddar. That's what I had at the house. Um, heating up your pan, I use a cast iron pan, dropping it into a pile and letting it melt into just a cheese tortilla, getting a big spatula, picking up that cheese tortilla and making your breakfast burrito out of a cheese tortilla. Ha! <laughs> oh, it is so good. It is so good. Now, I actually took a regular tortilla and put my cheese tortilla inside it like a freaking Taco Bell menu item or something, you know what I mean? And then I made my breakfast burrito and I did it for the whole family. And the flavor, first of all, when you heat up and um, you heat up cheese and it hardens a little bit and chars a little bit, you don't want it to burn. It unlocks like a new flavor so that you still put the cheese on the eggs and the bacon and the sausage and the onions that you put on the inside of the burrito. But the cheese flavor of this little cheese tortilla, and my wife, she doubted me. She saw me doing this, and I, and I was taking the cheese tortilla and I was putting on top of the regular tortilla, and she was like, it's not going to roll. It's not going to bend. You've created, she said, you created a chip. <laughs> I said, no, 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 no. This is not a chip. This is a cheese tortilla, and it is pliable. And then she rolled it up and it was pliable. It will stay pliable because it stays rubbery. It's a little bit crispy, but still rubbery. If you're low carb, you can do it straight up with the cheese, or you can just do it an extra layer in your burrito and you will thank me. If you like cheese, you will thank me. All right, that's it. That's the solo episode. Uh, we'll be back with a normal Rhett and Link episode next week. In the meantime, you can ask us questions, give us comments, at our voice message thing, one eight 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 earpod one Also, join the conversation on the internet with hashtag EarBiscuit so we can find what you think about this thing that we're doing. And we'll talk to you next week. Hey, guys. This one is specifically kind of for it. But um, as a girl that grew up in Panhandle, Florida, I had had my feel of country music as I know it. Like, I, I like the, the oldies, you know what I mean? But for the most part, I completely have just fallen away from country music. But James and the Shame has really, really brought me back. Like, it's, it's made me fall back in love with country music like I was when I was like that six-year-old kid. So, but it actually, I relate to it now. So thanks. Keep doing what you're doing. To watch more Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist on the right. To watch the previous episode of Ear Biscuits, click on the playlist to the left. And don't forget to click on the circular icon to subscribe. If you prefer to listen to this podcast, it's available on all your favorite podcast platforms. Thanks for being your mythical best.